Also dieses Italien in sein Ding, der Peter Sotter, das war so in so einem sehr historischen Prozess. With the stroke of a pen, an Italian diplomat commits his nation to the Entente. His counterparts from Britain, Russia, and France blot their signatures, and as the ink begins to dry, the three negotiators shake hands on a job well done. For the past year, Italy has declared strict neutrality in the war between the Entente and the Central Powers, despite their former alignment with Germany and Austria-Hungary. Berlin has pressured Vienna to honor Italian territorial demands in a bid to motivate Rome to take military action against the Entente, but Vienna has proven reluctant and their inaction has brought Italy to these secret negotiations. With promises of Austrian territory after their inevitable victory, Italy prepares to go to war alongside Britain, France, and Russia. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, against the armchair Chicago. historian. Although Italy was officially a member of the Triple Alliance with Germany and Austria-Hungary, the country kept itself out of conflict following Franz Ferdinand's assassination in 1914. After all, the Triple Alliance was a defensive pact. Berlin and Vienna were the aggressors, and neutrality gave the Italian government the ability to both avoid the privations of war and solicit the best possible terms under which to commit their military to either side. In April of 1915, Italy concluded secret negotiations with Britain and France, who promised them Secretly. Austrian territory that the Italians had long coveted. With these assurances in hand, Italy marched to war against Austria-Hungary. In this video, we will look at the carnage and losses Italy sustained while throwing countless troops oh against the Austrian defenses along the Isonzo River, a campaign that failed strategically, tactically, and in some cases, morally. As Italy marshaled her men, its commanders turned their eyes toward Austria-Hungary. The two countries shared an alpine border, with breathtaking mountain ranges that, in peacetime, provided enviable skiing and hiking. But in wartime, the peaks were natural fortresses, and the Austrians had long since capitalized on their mountainous frontier, digging in and building fortifications along the Italian border. Further complicating matters was the Isonzo River, which had experienced record rainfall over the last year, and would continue to flood its banks through 1918. The swollen Isonzo acted as a moat to the mountain's castle, presenting the Italians with a considerable offensive challenge. Overcoming these obstacles would require careful planning and a logical strategic vision, two qualities that Italian Field Marshal and Commander of the Austrian Front, Luigi Cadorna, would fail to apply. Cadorna, who was named Chief of Staff in the early days of the war, was known for successfully reforming the Italian army. The force he would lead was better organized, though still lacking in equipment. A keen proponent of frontal assaults, Cadorna drew up plans to charge across the Isonzo River into the mountainous frontier, dislodging the Austrians and breaking through their defensive lines to drive for Slovenia. From there, the Italian army could threaten Vienna. Cadorna would pursue this objective by launching multiple offensives across the Isonzo River, meeting the Austrians in battle a total of 12 times, our titular Battles of the Isonzo. Yes, better, better, better. Cadorna, with no one to check him, launched the first Battle of the Isonzo on June 23, 1915. The Italians opened up their okay, well, well, well. With a brief artillery barrage before throwing themselves headlong at the Austrian positions. The Italians outnumbered their foes two to one, but the Austrians were, again, dug in on mountains. Assault after assault was thrown back, and by the end of the day, the Italians had lost over 15,000 men and gained some small footholds on the Austrian side, occupying the heights overlooking the Slovene town of Bovets and taking the westernmost edge of the Karst Plateau. The Austrians took 10,000 losses in their defense, and the action would pause for 11 days as both sides licked their wounds. Cadorna would take his time to reassess his strategic outlook, consulting with his subordinates and, wait, that's not right, no, he ordered a frontal assault. 
the Italians launched yep. the second battle of Isonzo on July 18th. With the weight of numbers on their side, but lacking critical supplies like ammunition, the Italians were nevertheless able to carve deeper into the Austrian line. Brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat raged on the Karst Plateau. The Italians succeeded in occupying the strategically important Mount Batonica in the northern section of the Isonzo Front, and Capuccio Wood fell into Italian hands as well, enabling them to menace the Austrians at the town of Gorizza. Cadorna would order offensive operations to cease on August 3rd, as both sides began to run out of ammunition and will. For these minor gains, the Italians traded the lives of 41,000 men, while the Austrians lost 46,000. Yes. Fighting would pause for two months after this bloodbath, with Cadorna launching his next attack on October 18th. The Italians made significant strides in the materiel department in the lead-up to this engagement, issuing their men Adrian helmets and bringing their total number of artillery pieces along the Isonzo to 1,250. Cadorna's main objective was the seizure of Gorizia, and to accomplish this, he spread his force out along the entire Isonzo, intending to move as a single, overwhelming line. The Italian assault was screened by their most intense artillery barrage yet, as Cadorna had finally begun to realize the value of artillery as a preface to his go-to mass infantry charges. Cadorna ordered a direct attack on Bovets, in addition to the main maneuver intended to outflank the defenders of Gorizia. This flanking maneuver was focused on the hill at Monte San Michele, where the Austrians were reinforced by troops from the Balkan Front under Field Marshal Svetosar Borjovic. The upshot was more of the same, the Austrians on the high ground repulsing the Italians trying to unseat them. Mm -hmm. A two-week so in, lull in the, the fighting ground. saw Cadorna change his strategy, and the Italians resumed their offensive by deploying concentrated forces on small areas. Borjevic and his that, men could quite literally see this coming a mile away, and reorganized their lines to meet the Italians' massed formation to massed formation. Groups, right? Their elevated positions allowed the Austrians to neutralize the Italian numerical advantage, and the Third Battle of Isonzo would yet again see the Italians fail to meet their objectives. The Italians added 67,000 men to their casualty count, with the Austrians taking 41,000. The fourth battle of the Isonzo launched November 10th, with the Italians once again focusing on the area around Gorizia. The Italians continued their strategy of large and costly attacks that provided little in terms of meeting objectives, capturing some Austrian territory and launching five attacks on Monte Sebuzi, near Gorizia, that were all repulsed. The Austrians could count another defensive victory at the cost of 32,000 casualties, while the Italians racked up another 49,000. As the end of November came and the cold set in, grand maneuvers gave way to localized skirmishing. With both sides running low on supplies and winter about to set in, an unspoken truce took hold. What? The winter break gave the Italians time to shore up their offensive, and Cadorna added a full eight divisions to his numbers. On March 9th, 1916, the fifth battle of the Isonzo began, with the Italians it's trying yet again better. to take the area around Gorizia. This time, the Italian assault yielded an actual strategic gain, as Cadorna's mm. men seized the ridgeline at Mount Sabatino, mm, overlooking Bansing. Gorizia. It only cost them 2,000 men, a casualty figure the Austrians mirrored. It should be noted that this battle was part of a grander strategy, as the Entente hoped to use the Italian assault to pull the Central Powers' focus from the battles at Verdun and the Eastern Front. Speaking of the Eastern Front, the Russian Brusilov offensive caused an Austrian drawdown along the Isonzo, as troops were pulled from the Italian meat grinder to shore up the Austro-German lines against the Tsarist attack. As the Austrians drew their troops down, Cadorna drew up plans for yet another assault on the Isonzo region, with a view to finally capture Gorizia. Italian sappers on Mount Sabatino dug tunnels stretching behind the Austrian positions. 
the Italians hoped to use underground passageways to slip behind their enemy's mm, defenses and well. occupy Sabatino's peak. On August 6th, the Italians bombarded Gorizia directly, raining shells upon their target as they launched assaults on Austrian positions. As the Italians made gains, Boriovich requested reinforcements, but Vienna denied his plea. Boriovich committed his reserves to the defense of Sabatino, but could only look on as the Italians seized the rest of the mountain in less than an hour. For once, the Italians held the high ground. The Austrians retreated, and the defensive line around Gorizia that had so long stymied the Italians disintegrated, Cadorna's forces capturing the main southern road into the town to cement their imminent advance. Boryovich's force, bloodied and forced from their positions, abandoned Gorizia to the Italians, retreating to emplacements along the mountaintops to the north and east. As his men occupied the long-sought-after Gorizia, Cadorna ordered an end to the attack. The Italians had finally met an objective, but between their continued reliance on frontal assaults and the Austrians' desperate employment of chemical weapons in this battle, they suffered a staggering 51,000 casualties over the 11 years of fighting. This would be the zenith of Italy's success, and like all operations along the Isonzo, it was costly. Cadorna would follow up his Feric victory the next month, launching the three-day 7th Battle of the Isonzo from September 14th to the 17th, with Romania's entry into the war on August 27th, and increasing Entente pressure on Austria and Germany, Cadorna began to believe it was only a matter of time until his foes simply buckled under his tactics of attrition. The Austrians would ultimately surrender in this battle, handing Cadorna a minor victory at best. Both sides would suffer around 20,000 casualties in the fight, and Cadorna would extend matters with the similarly brief 8th Battle of the Isonzo the following October, meant to extend the Nova Vos bridgehead even further into Austrian territory, which resulted in two days of inconclusive battles that did little more than further bloody both forces. November would bring the mm, last Isonzo battle of 1916. This ninth battle would see the Italians strike at the Slovenian town of Vertoiba, still seeking a path through Slovenia to Vienna, as well as along the Karst Plateau. As usual, the Italians' numbers proved little match for the Austrians' natural defensive positions, and the ninth battle proved a defensive victory for the Austrians. But while they may have repulsed the Italian attack, the defenders were beginning to feel the weight of their losses, and their lines grew increasingly thin. Confident that Cadorna would continue to wear them down, the Austrians requested help from Germany. For his part, Cadorna saw that his own forces were wearing both out and down. His casualty figures were mounting, and the field marshal began to see he had little to show for it. As fighting paused for the winter, Cadorna received assurances from the French and British that if the Germans provided the Austrians with substantial enough support, he could count on their own troops joining him in the field. Buoyed by the prospect of wasting the lives of other nations' men, Cadorna and his allied counterparts laid plans for the Tenth Battle of the Isonzo, which, like the Fifth, would dovetail with allied operations on the Western Front, in this case, the 1917 Enna Offensive. The Austrians would be rudely awoken on May 12, 1917, by an Italian bombardment, an overture to the Tenth Isonzo Battle. Over two days, the Italians shelled the Austrian positions before launching assaults on the port city of Trieste and the fortified Monte San Gabriella. Seizing the mountain would have opened up the Vipaco Valley behind Gorizia. Over 15 days, the Italians would advance to within 23 kilometers, or roughly 14 miles, of Trieste. But their drive against Monte San Gabriella would meet fierce Austrian resistance and flounder. On June 3rd, the Austrians launched a fierce counterattack, reversing the Italians' gains almost entirely. For their momentary advance, the Italians lost 150,000 men, compared to the Austrian defenders' 90,000. The Italians yeah, now plummeted in the face of this reversal of fortune, manifesting as outright mutiny. 
Italian soldiers refused to attack the Austrians in some locations. They even kept saying Gracia. Yeah. beginning to resist him, but sure the Austrians would buckle eventually, Cadorna did the rational thing and consulted with his... Wait, no, that's not right. No, he ordered another frontal assault. Oh, the 11th battle of the Isonzo opened with yet another artillery barrage. This one including over 5.5 million artillery shells on August 18th. The Italians poured across the river on pontoon bridges with the goal of occupying the Beinsitza Plateau, which would divide the Austrians in two and cut the Austrian strongholds at Monte San Gabriella and Monte Ermada off from each other. The Italians succeeded in occupying the plateau, but their assaults on the fortified mountains fared as well as their previous assaults on the high ground. The Italians lost the initiative, but after two years of attrition warfare, the Austrians were too far exhausted and underprepared to seize it for themselves. Technically, the Italians won the 11th battle, but their assaults on the fortified Austrian positions cost them around 150,000 casualties, and their second army would find itself divided by the river, a critical weakness in disposition that the Austrians would take advantage of. The stage was set for the final fight for the Isonzo, the Battle of Caporetto. As the Italians dug into their positions, and the Austrians tried to marshal what strength they could, German forces began arriving to reinforce the Austrians, and together they would open the battle on October 24th. In a role reversal for the ages, the Austro-German forces were the aggressors, launching a cloud of poison gas at the Italian trenches. The Italians broke in the face of this, abandoning their positions with gas nipping at their heels and hundreds falling as the noxious fumes clawed at their lungs. Austro-German engineers next detonated mines underneath hard points in the Italian line, clearing the way for a combined infantry assault that sent the Italians into a panic. As German stormtroopers led the way, Austro-German oh, and light artillery pounded the Italians. The Italian 2nd Army, split during the previous battle, began to rout. The 2nd's commander asked Cadorna for permission to withdraw, but the field marshal proved as dogged on defense as he was on offense and ordered the 2nd to hold firm. The Italians did their best to hold, but after six days, Cadorna relented and ordered a general retreat on October 30th. The Italians fled with the Germanic forces in hot pursuit, weathering Austrian ambushes as they fled toward home. But success would prove a double-edged sword for the Austro-German forces. The Italian retreat was so desperate, and the Germanic pursuit so determined, that the Austrian and Germans outstripped their supply lines. The Italians soon retreated over the Piave River, establishing defensive lines on the shores of Italy itself, but the Austro-German forces were too under-provisioned and too exhausted to mount an effective invasion of Italy, and both sides settled in on either bank of the river. The retreat was a complete disaster for Italy, the Germanic attack had cost them 300,000 casualties, and morale among their troops was so low that a great many simply surrendered to the advancing Austro-German army. A martinet with a penchant for executing his own people had broken the soul of his forces with his constant frontal charges and promotion of harsh discipline. For example, a mutinous brigade of 120 men was subjected to a Roman-style decimation or the killing yes. of 10% of their number after they rebelled against their commanders and killed officers and military policemen. It should be noted that it is not clear whether this single instance of imperial justice was Cadorna's doing. But regardless, the debacle of the Battle of Caporetto showed Cadorna for the brute he was, and the chief of staff was forced into an ignominious resignation. The battles of the Isonzo were a stain on Italy's military record a campaign of attrition that failed to meet its major objectives. For the Austrians, the Isonzo battles were simultaneously a massive drain on resources and a successful defense of their frontier. The fighting was isolated to ethnically Slovene territory, and 30,000 Slovenes died during the battles, most conscripts in the Austro-Hungarian army. Other Slovenes were removed from Gorizia and other Italian conquests and shipped to internment centers. 
The Italians there treated these civilians as enemies, and thousands would die of malnutrition. On all sides, Italian, Austro-Hungarian, and civilian, the battles of the Isonzo were a bloody mire without success, a tragic tale told by Cadorna, full of death and fury, signifying nothing. Okay,